the Rhineland. In fact, when we look at the first times that Jews start referring to themselves as being Ashkenazi, which is around the 12th century, they're basically talking about the Rhineland. And in the centuries prior to that, because there are Jews in this region considerably earlier, they speak about themselves as being Rhineland Jews. And later that somehow morphs into Ashkenaz Jews, perhaps borrowing from this idea that the children of Ashkenaz moved somewhere north, and this is somewhere north, but there's no other real connection between the name Ashkenaz in the Bible and this region which Jews later came to call Ashkenaz. Um, so today I have been trying to get to the um, answer to the question that has been on my mind, and that is, where did the Ashkenazi come from and where did, if the Jews are not Ashkenaz, then what happened to Ashkenaz? So um, I have been looking at a few things here. I will share some of it with you. Uh, I'll just give some quick thoughts on this. So what I have um, come, the conclusion that I have come to is that Ashkenaz, which is located here, which is in Turkey, was the place where these people originated from. And they are claiming that they were from elsewhere, but I do not believe that. I believe, here's, here's what I believe, they migrated due to... Um, persecution or, or trouble with, let's just say, with Rome and with Islam at the time, they went up into this area called Georgia here, and this is where the Khazaria Empire was. They speak about themselves as being Rhineland Jews, and later that somehow morphs into Ashkenaz Jews, perhaps borrowing from this idea that the children of Ashkenaz moved somewhere north, and this is somewhere north. And this is where why we say that they are Khazars. And from there, they migrated out west into um, Europe, into the Germany area, and from there, they went up into Poland, and then after being there for a while, then they went out into other places in the world, and even down into Israel. Now, <clears throat> to just give a quick summary of that again, they started down here in Turkey, they're Turkish people, where the land of Ashkenaz is, and they went up into um this area, Georgia, where the Khazarian Empire was. From there they went into Germany, Poland. And after being there and, um, and their population expanding, then they went out into other places in the world. Uh, what happened to those Ashkenazi Jews? They basically spread out to the eastern regions, uh, especially from about the 13th and 14th century onwards, and you get a much larger population of these Rhineland Jews living in Ashkenaz. And then in the late 19th century, there is a large flow of Jews to western locations and a smaller number to the land of Israel. So that's why, for example, in America, about three quarters of the Jews who moved to America at the beginning of the 20th century are Ashkenazic, um, and their descendants today, of course, are the dominant uh, sub-ethnic group among Jews. Which is completely contradictory, contradictory to what the Bible says happens to the Jews or the people who are in Judea at the um, fall of Jerusalem. Let's go down here to Israel. And the, the Lord Jesus Christ said, that Jerusalem would be compassed about with armies, and it was in 70 AD. And then those who were there had to flee into the um, wilderness, flee into the mountains, 
and those who were or who didn't make it were either were they either fell by the sword or they were led away captive. They were taken captive, and the Bible says, into all nations, not just into um what is this place called? <laughs> um Ashkenaz and then up into Khazaria and then into Poland. That's not what the Bible says was going to happen to the Jews. Now, the northern kingdom of Israel had already been scattered a long time ago. But the the here's the thing again, the main population of Jewry in the world or Jewish people in the world are the Ashkenazi and most of them came out of Poland. That's when the population boomed and expanded. And then they migrated else elsewhere. So up until here's a path they took again, and then they went out from there. But again, they were not led away captive. They didn't. They were not led away captive into the United States. They were not led away captive into other places in Europe. They were not led away captive into Poland. They were not led away captive anywhere. But I am going to let you hear um, some. Some Jewish sources and some non-Jewish sources. And I think it's ironic that the Jewish, Jewish, I'm sorry, I'm struggling with these words. The Jewish source, which is supposed to be defending the identity of Ashkenazi Jews, actually debunks the identity of Ashkenazi Jews by contradicting what the Bible says was supposed to happen to the Jews. The the, the prophecy that they would be led away captive into all nations. Another major opinion, also from the late 19th century, is that of uh, Shmuel Kraus, who argues that, no, they came from somewhat northern location, somewhat north of the Caspian Sea. Many scholars associate the region of the Ashkenaz descendants in the biblical mind as that of the Scythians, which is an ancient people um, in the region of what would be today, uh, let's say, Central Asia, uh, bordering on the Donbass region that is so much in the news today with the uh, the, the war in Ukraine. Um, uh, but Shmuel Cross offers another tantalizing suggestion, which would actually involve quite a bit of controversy, and that is that the uh, Khazar people should be associated with the uh, descendants of Ashkenaz. The Khazars are exceptionally important in Jewish history, and that's where we will turn next. But just to remember what we're speaking about here and keep these things separate, um, the biblical descendants of Ashkenaz have no real intrinsic connection with Jews other than describing a place where Jews would ultimately end up. That's a huge distinction that's important to remember, as we shall see towards the end of this lecture. Um, where actually is Ashkenaz in the Jewish mindset, as opposed to you know, scholarly opinions as to where Ashkenaz showed up? In reality, the Jews who call themselves Ashkenaz all come from a region or at least a culture in the Rhineland here in Germany, as you can see in this map. This is the region which Jews began to call Ashkenaz from about the 12th century on. And the Jews who ended up in the Rhineland started calling themselves Ashkenazi, just like I would call myself Canadian. Uh, but there's no like kind of uh, derivation of lineage from the biblical Ashkenaz to modern Jews. We do know, however, from multiple data points that there were Jews who called themselves Khazarian. They show up in a few places. Medieval Jewish travelers encounter them. They have various things to say about them. They're certainly not in large numbers, and there's a lot of questions about the degree to which they are well associated with the Jewish tradition, as we shall see. Rather than going into more of the military and politics of the Khazars, we'll instead discuss two things that they are known for above all others, their religion and their trade. Unlike the vast majority of empires in Eurasia at the time, and perhaps uniquely among them, 
the Khazars were officially a Jewish state, having converted in roughly the year 740, though the date is a matter of scholarly debate. What was the reason for this, and how did it come to pass? At the beginning of the 8th century, the Mediterranean world was polarized primarily between Christianity and Islam, faiths which served almost as the religious arm of their respective realms, and would inevitably be used to gain political domination over the newly converted. The Khazar Empire was a powerful realm of its own, which represented a third force, and had proved itself a diplomatic and military equal to the Caliphate and the Empire, even having placed their own candidate on the Roman throne. Yet, interacting with these sophisticated civilizations had made Khazar rulers realize that their Tengriist shaman beliefs could not grant spiritual, legal and dynastic legitimacy like the great monotheistic faiths could. However, the Khazars could not accept Christianity or Islam. Accepting conversion to either superpower's religion would automatically subordinate Khazars to either the Emperor or the Caliph. So, it seemed like the only logical choice was to, as the third major power, choose the third major religion, which did not have as many strings attached, Judaism. How this happened isn't entirely certain. There was no momentous event like Rome's Battle of the Milvian Bridge, for example, which eventually led to the Empire's conversion to Christianity. However, there are certain trends which can explain why it happened when it did. Even before the Khazar ruling caste put Tengriism aside, the Northern Kingdom, as Byzantium called it, had extensive connections with Jews and their religious practices. There were old prominent Jewish communities on the Crimean and Taman peninsulas which had existed ever since Greek and Roman times, living in cities such as Panticapium and Phanagoria. External events in the early 700s were to increase the Jewish presence in Khazaria to an unprecedented degree. Persecution of Jews in the Byzantine Empire began in the reign of Justinian, but particularly intensified under the reigns of Heraclius and Leo III the Assyrian, the latter of whom sought to forcibly baptize and thus convert Jewish citizens to Christianity in 722. While Leo's decree was not effectively enforced, the policy led many Jews to flee from Byzantium and into Khazar lands. You see, this is what happened to Ashkenaz. This is where they went. Ashkenaz went from Turkey up into what is known as Khazaria. That is where they went. And these are the same people who claim to be Ashkenazi Jews. The policy led many Jews to flee from Byzantium and into Khazar lands, including from Roman possessions in Crimea. Simultaneously, the Jews also migrated into Khazaria from the Muslim world, but in far smaller numbers. The refugees which fled to Khazar lands represented themselves as bearers of an old, sophisticated, ancient culture, and were almost definitely a key factor in creating a cosmopolitan outlook of tolerance in Atil, the Khazar capital, which Arab travelers admired. It can also be speculated that Jewish missionary refugees, who also brought Byzantine arts, crafts and superior methods of agriculture and trade, probably used this influence to persuade the inner Khazar tribes of the political and spiritual advantages of conversion to the neutral Judaism. Whatever the case, by the mid-800s at the latest, Jewish-themed Moses coins were being issued in Khazar territories. They were a warlike tribe that lived deep in the heart of Asia. And they were so warlike that even the Asiatics drove them out of Asia into Eastern Europe. And to reduce this so you don't get too confused about the history of Eastern Europe, they set up this big Khazar kingdom, 800,000 square miles, only there was no Russia, there were no other countries, and the Khazar Kingdom was the biggest country in all Europe. So big and so powerful 
that when the other monarchs wanted to go to war, the Khazars would loan them 40,000 soldiers. That's how big and powerful they were. Now, they were phallic worshippers. This is filthy, I don't want to go into the details of that now. It was their religion, the way it was the religion of many other pagans or barbarians elsewhere in the world. Now, the king became so disgusted with the degeneracy of his kingdom that he decided to adopt a so-called monotheistic faith, either Christianity, Islam, Muslim faith, or what is known today as Judaism, really Talmudism. So, by spinning a top, he said, eeny, meeny, miny, mo," and he picked out so-called Judaism. And that became the state religion, and he sent down to uh, the uh, Talmudic schools of Talabitha and Sura, and brought up thousands of the rabbis with their teachings, and he opened up synagogues and schools in his kingdom of 800,000 people, 800,000 square miles, and maybe 10 to 20 million people, and they became what we call Jews. There wasn't one of them that ever had an ancestor that ever put a toe in the Holy Land, not alone in Old Testament history, but back to time, the beginning of time. And the blessing of Abraham come on every office, through every person that enters into that place. And that the blessing flow beyond any manifestation that any of these people have ever seen. And suddenly, suddenly they will say, we can no longer turn our backs on the nation of Israel and we will stand and we will be firm and we will win and not lose.